Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our new episode of The Three Whisketeers, the show that likes to share our whiskey and have a lot of fun. Now, my name is Jamie. I'm your host. We have our angel here, Hipster Curtis, our happy hunter, and Eddie. We have Max to, next to me, and we have Nathan, and then Justin. So this is the Driftless Glen Distillery here in Bearville, Wisconsin. The, it's kind of a craft whiskey distillery. Um, we're going to go through a little guided tour, um, see what it's like to be to be a new, young distillery. So I'll hand it off to you guys, and we can go ahead and go through a tour. Absolutely. Awesome. So come on, guys. Follow us. <laughs> So yeah, so coming out of the hallway, you'll notice some pictures. So everybody always asks, you know, Driftless, where did you get that name from, right? So we're actually standing in the Driftless region, so that area the glacier did not hit. That's why when you guys are rolling into town, you see a lot of cool bluffs and landscaping all over the place. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can see some pictures here. Uh, what's that rock called, Max? Uh, Balance Rock. Balance Rock. So that's right down the road at Devil's Oh, Lake. this is a real thing. That's a real thing. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Devil's Slate's got so cool FD oh. mounds too. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Man, so man, that's man. right down the road, what, 10 minutes? Oh, closer. Nine. Closer than that. Wow, well, all right. State Park, real close. So go do some hiking and then come on down here and have yeah. lunch and lunch and sip on some cocktails. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so opened in 2014 um, by our wonderful owners, Brian and Renee Venus. Uh, so you can see the picture here that's Brian and Renee and our, our beloved distillery puppy, Marlin. Uh, filling the first barrel, which you'll see later on in the tour. We, we hide it back in the Rick House. So, um, avid supporters of the military as well, as you can see here. So, they love supporting the armed forces. Uh, we did a special barrel pick with the Combat Rescue Helicopter Group out of Ohio. Uh, so, they sell that right on their PX down there, which is pretty cool. Um, so, Brian is a uh, very successful entrepreneur in his own right. Uh, owns a number of car dealerships and businesses down in the Chicagoland area. Uh, Renee, a very accomplished sculptor and artist. Uh, so we'll show you some of her sculptures that we have hiding around this story as well today. So um, other than that, Tanya, do you have anything else you'd want to touch on? I'm not um, um, joined by Tanya. <laughs> uh, what's your, what's your I, title then? I'm the National Marketing Manager for Driftless Glen, and I started out uh, doing their marketing, and then I've been with them in a full-time capacity for the last seven months. So it's been fun learning a lot about you know, the distilling process and also the industry as a whole. Great. And you enjoy whiskey also, right? Oh yeah, I love whiskey, <laughs> bourbon, rye, brandy, we've got some good product. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, follow us into where the magic happens. So this is the uh, distillery where the magic happens. We've got a variety of spirits that we produce here at Driftless Glen. Uh, our focus and passion is uh, really with the whiskey. So, whiskey, basically a grain-based, distilled, barrel-aged spirit. Uh, and this is the starting point for that. All of the grain is coming to us in these 2,600-gallon super sacks. Um, take it away, Max is our match technician. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, these, uh, we do try our best to source the grains as locally as possible. Um, you know, uh, but when it comes to square one, uh, uh, the grain, we definitely can't sacrifice quality. So we've had to shop around a little bit. Uh, the corn and the rye, they're currently coming from Hodgson Mill out of Effingham, Illinois. Uh, the malt comes from this company, Brees, out of Chilton, Wisconsin. So uh, all Midwestern grain, uh, we say it's local enough. But uh, let's see. So yeah, they come to us in these big 2,500 pound super sacks. Uh, we'll take these super sacks. Set them up onto the shaker here, this bitch vibrates to bust up any clumps. Bring goes down up through this auger into our uh, 2600 gallon mash cooker. So, uh, into here goes all the grain, uh, a bunch of water, a couple of different commercial enzymes that we use. Um, and by use of water, heat, and enzymes, we're breaking down complex chains of sugar molecules in the grain uh, starch. We're breaking down these starches down into simple sugars fermentable sugars that can then in turn be eaten by the yeast during fermentation. Um, so into each mash we're putting uh, uh, about 110 bushels of grain that uh, comes out to a little over 6,000 pounds we're cramming into there. But uh, let's see. Um, really pushing the equipment to its capacity yeah. I, I would say with, with our batches. And the types of grain that we use determine uh, the type of whiskey it's going to be. So bourbon for example is primarily made using corn. 
rye, primarily using rye. Yeah. Right. Cider, so right. that's all determined at this stage, the product that we're going to be making. Exactly. So uh, it takes me five, six hours to cook one of these. I can do two in a day. Uh, it's a lot like running a marathon though, so I'll do that as needed. But uh, typically we're cooking a mash a day and running the stills once a day. But uh, let's see, that's, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So um, towards the end of the cook, I'll cool it down a little bit below 90 degrees. Uh, we'll then pump out the bottom here into one of these five fermentations. Let's take a look at that. Take a look up there, you can see right down in the fermentation tanks. Um, let's see, so we've uh, broken down these starches down into simple sugars. Uh, over the next four to six days, uh, the yeast cells are going to eat up as much of that sugar as they can and use it to produce three things. Uh, alcohol, heat, and carbon dioxide. Uh, unfortunately, two of those things kill yeast, alcohol and heat. Uh, so we need to keep these tanks cooled. You'll see around the inside of the tanks are four inch cooling coils. They keep them at a constant 75 degrees or so throughout fermentation. Um, but uh, secondly, carbon dioxide. So uh, especially in the first couple of days when this is really active, you'll see it bubbling on the top, almost like it's boiling. Uh, it self agitates, so it's constantly rolling around, turning itself. It's pretty neat. But uh, lastly, alcohol. So by the end of that four to six days, the yeast will have produced enough alcohol to kill it all off, at which point we're about ready to distill. Uh, the idea here though is to create an environment in which the yeast is going to stay happy, healthy, hungry most importantly, uh, just long enough in order to get those sugar levels down to nearly nothing. Um, so by the end of the cook, uh, we're at uh, 17 to 18 percent sugar, uh, depending on the product, but uh, by the end of fermentation, that's down to less than half a percent sugar, and it's at about 10 percent alcohol by volume, uh, a lot like a strong beer at this point. Um, very similar process to making beer, uh, give or take a few elements, but uh, yeah, around the end of fermentation, we'll pump out of the bottom here into the beer well, this big tank on the end. It's a 5,000 5, gallon tank, um, easily the biggest in the room. Uh, but uh, it's really just a great big mixing tank that feeds the still on the other side of it, but uh, we'll show you that in a second. Yeah, and one yeah. thing, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say, one thing that I love pointing out too is uh, us craft guys love supporting local as much as we can, right? And keeping it in the, let's say, the state or the area. So Brian and Renee are very passionate about that. So if you notice our fermentation tanks were all made in Sauk City, Wisconsin, just oh, that's minutes awesome. down the road. Uh, our water tanks, right, Edgar, Wisconsin. Uh, however, the, the, the and our, our racking system is all made right here in town by a fabricator named Spakey Palmer. So uh, we try to keep as much of it local as we can, of course, without sacrificing quality, which is uh, why when we go on the next part of this tour, you'll you'll notice we went to Kentucky for our stills. So we'll let, we'll let Max show you that part. Uh, I just like the sound this makes right here. It's a really nice echo. Yeah, uh, empty. Unfortunately, we're in the middle of some bottling projects and maintenance stuff, but yeah, yeah I do that a lot myself. <laughs> So after fermentation, like Max said, we've got um, about 2,600 gallons of basically strong beer. So the next stage for us is distillation, um, which of course is the separation of compounds at different boiling points. What we're doing at this stage is trying to extract all of the alcohol that we've produced during the fermentation process. And the first step for that, after the beer well, is our 42 foot, 18 inch continuous column still. Um, this and the pot still were produced at uh, Beds on Copper Grass Works out of Louisville, Kentucky, and shipped up here, actually all in one piece. This was installed with a 100-foot crane that dropped the entire, uh, the entire still down through the ceiling, so that was pretty cool. Um, and we're able to process this very efficiently on a column still. That's the idea here is efficiency. So what would take us a, an entire week to distill uh, in just pot stills, we can run through this column still in a single shift. So 2,600 gallons all the way through here. What's happening, we're directly injecting steam into the bottom. The mash is being injected towards the top of the still. It travels uh, across each of the 20 distillation trays until it reaches the bottom. 
it's being hit with steam at each stage, vaporizing the alcohol. The waste that which reaches the bottom um, is going to be you know, very low in alcoholic content. That's pumped outside uh, through a liquid solid separator. So the spent grain that we produce here is being sent off to be used as cattle feed or hog feed. The wastewater is sent out to a digester converted into fertilizer. So that's how we're managing the waste, but what we get off the top, the alcohol vapor that's condensed and collected into one of these two tanks uh, on either side of the, the spirit safes. And that is uh, between five and 600 gallons of high proof white dog. Um, again, this is the first step for all the whiskey. From there, uh, if we need to do a polishing run on that, those spirits will be transferred into our 500 gallon pot still. So we've extracted all of the alcohol at this first stage. The pot still is here for the polishing run and that allows us to separate um, out different compounds that may have arose uh, during fermentation. We don't want in the final product referred to as heads and tails. So different compounds with different boiling points and we're able to control that by redistilling in the pot still here. Now these are all copper. Uh, Copper is used partly because it's great at conducting heat and also it removes sulfuric compounds. Um, so, excellent for, for processing whiskey. Up to this point, um, after this point, we have about enough whiskey to fill 10 53 gallon barrels, um, and we're doing that every day. So, a single batch fermented, distilled, by the end of it, we have enough to fill about 10 barrels of whiskey or about 3,000 bottles of booze, give or take. That's what we're, we're cooking every day here. So when we're in production, cooking, distilling, barreling, about 3,000 bottles of whiskey a day is what we're pumping out. So that's the stage in a nutshell. You guys have any questions about that at this point? Well, I went out here uh, on both, but I did anyways. <laughs> but it was fun. I mean, I saw that thing spinning and all I wanted to do is go like this. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know, do you guys ever do that? <laughs> that exact. Yeah, that exact way, yeah. 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 yeah, this is quite, this is like state of the art stuff. It's really, it's really nice. And you know what? To look at it, you would think we're, we're a huge facility. All this equipment is obviously very big, but there's really very little automation out here. So our process is still very hands on. Uh, we're doing it, obviously. Uh, pretty large scale, but every step of the way, I mean, it's us hoisting those grain bags into the cooker, it's us you know, turning the valves and, and doing all of this, still very much by hand. So, okay. it's hey. on a big scale, but it's it's like a craft distillery. And it's, it's just these two guys. Okay. This is it. We, yep. don't, we don't have a team of 10 guys we hide back in another warehouse to handle a lot of this legwork. This is all them every day. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. We've had a little bit of help with bottling and warehouse management, but uh, those guys seem to come and go, but yeah, you know, it keeps ending up. We've had help on and off, and, and we on should and say, off. too, that um, we were not the, the head distillers right off the bat. And Max and I came on as assistants and uh, sort of worked our way up or through process of elimination, find ourselves now in charge. Uh, of keeping this thing running, but at the moment it is just the two of us. So everything from the, the bags of grain to the bottle of whiskey, all hard work. It's, it's everything in between. Filling and racking barrels, filling bottles, uh, stacking orders. Yeah, it's start to finish it. Yeah. So is this in maximum capacity right now, or could you guys? Oh God! If no. you guys got some people, we, you, you could probably make a lot more, right? We could go to three ships in the future if, uh, if it comes to that. Okay. Uh, so the bottom right there would be fermenters, so we need to get a couple more tanks in the room. But uh, okay. yeah, theoretically, we could go to a yeah. couple more ships if we recognized as one of the largest distilleries, specifically in the Midwest, because we do have the capacity to produce and you know the ability to keep cranking. Big time, we are in the top 10% largest crafts in the country. Um, we're running relatively huge equipment here for the craft. Yeah. Well, again, we could be efficient. Yeah, you will not find right. too many 42 footers in the Midwest. Right. Yeah. Outside of Tennessee, you can tell. Well, and there's a funny story around that, too. We've got some cool photos. When originally the still was brought in, uh, they thought it was going to be smaller. Uh, so they ended up filling out the steeple here. That. You guys might be able to speak a little bit better to so that. that. That would have been a little before our time, but yeah, that's that's. I can't tell if that's an old wife's tale or if that's true. 
That's how the uh, story goes. Yeah, yeah. The lore of Christmas it's time. very true. It's a, a bit of a happy accident. There was yeah. some miscommunication about the size of this column. Uh, so when it showed up, we found we had to tear out this whole wall and put in this steeple. Uh, I mean, uh, it does give the building a very distinct look. Uh, and yeah, the steeple allows us to accommodate uh, this monster still. But, uh, and, and that allows us to produce what we produce. Um, yeah. Oh, sure. Yes, I know. You can see the columns still lit up. Mm. It's kind of like our 51 ride, right? A very happy accident. We keep running into those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. yeah. It's bound to happen. It's good. So do you guys keep track of how, how much grain, what points you... So when you're making something, you're consistently doing it over and over again, or are you doing a lot of experimentation? Not so much experimentation. Uh, hopefully we'll have some room for that in the future. I think you guys tried our single malt. Um, that would be the most experimentation we've done. Uh, we've got a nice smoked whiskey maybe hitting our shelves pretty soon. Uh, it's called the White Label, the exclusive series. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's only available here in-house. That'll be, you know, one-offs that we happen to have laying around from the past or, you know, hopefully room for experimentation in the future. Mm -hmm. Oh, you like it? I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, we're going to try and put up 100 barrels this year and see how it does. Uh, Probably but, malt uh, whiskey. The malt whiskey, that is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we're hoping, you know, right now the goal is to get the brand off the ground, you know, get the bourbon and the rye and uh, the other products, uh, you know, rocking and rolling, and then hopefully in the future a little bit more room for experimentation. I've heard a rumor of a weed in Coming? Yeah, we have like 100 barrels of that sitting around. <laughs> I, can, I can pull a sample of that today, actually. Uh, it's about time. I, I would not object to that. It's at about all. time to check up on it, actually. So, yeah, yeah, I'll give it a good double dance. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm eager to see what that one does myself. So. Yeah. So, we pretty much got everything here in this room. Do we have anything else you want to well, One more share? thing. Um, you know, Nathan brought up a little bit about how we're recycling the spent grains in the water. And I think that's a huge thing for people to understand yeah. that there's a big expense that goes into that with the trucking that goes off site. And not a lot of, you know, startups would be able to absorb that cost. Um, most facilities have it running through the wastewater treatment in, in their towns, but we're not able to do that because of the capacity and, and the large scale um, production that we're doing. So our owners have come up and you know met with the city. Um, we work with uh, Anaerobic Digester in Madison, who regularly is here taking it off site to be recycled. So the water goes to energy, and then, like Nathan was saying, feed, it goes right. to cattle feed for the grain. That's why our, that's why our cows in Wisconsin are so happy. <laughs> oh. So the cool well, I like thing, the cheese. <laughs> yeah, the cool thing about that is we're able to say we're a zero percent waste distillery in terms of like the distillation process. That's great, and that's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, man, I, I hope a lot of people pay attention to that because we like the fact that you guys go out of your way to just do mo lo mo the most local you can do, mm -hmm. work with locals and then just recycle everything else the best you can. It's like right. uh, you're trying to just do just a good job overall. Yeah, so it's fun because we've been starting to say like we're, you know, grain to glass and back to farm. Mm. I think that's a really unique thing in this this industry. <laughs> we, we wish this part was more complicated. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, no, so after, uh, after our final product is distilled, uh, they call it white dog, um, we'll then it's coming off the still between 130, 140. Um, so uh, at that point, we will proof it down to 117. That's our barrel proof, uh, just for the sake of consistency. Um, using a reverse osmosis system, RO water, um, basically to cut that down to a barrel proof, we'll fill nine or 10 barrels a day uh, on average, and uh, off they go to the Rick House to age. Yeah, and you, you, will, you will see this, the barrels you can see laying around here, guys, are all 25 gallon barrels. So that's that's what we initially filled. Uh, however, now these guys are exclusively filling 53s. That's yeah, the idea behind the small barrels is they're designed to age a little bit quicker. There's more surface area per gallon of liquid inside, so they'll pick up character a little faster. That allowed us to get some product out on the shelves in a hurry. Um, 
and uh, we're now exclusively filling with 53 gallon barrels and you know, those will sit 5, 10, uh, hopefully longer, 15, 20 year reserve if we can. Woo! Oh, when you guys come back up for the 20 reserve launch, we might all look a little different. Yeah. yeah. So what's, what's, what's the oldest? What's the oldest barrel you guys have here then? We have stuff turning four years old every day. Um, okay. Uh, a little over four years is our oldest. Stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's most of what's going on the shelf right now between three and a half. Yeah. And four. Okay. We can talk more about that. Yeah, absolutely. November's when we'll hit our five year. That's right. Yeah. That's right. At a point, year. we'll be not putting anything to the bottle younger than five years. Okay. And then, of course, we'll do a you know, special edition 10 year special yeah. edition. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a way how many do you plan on reserving it? Do you know yet for that? That's the best I can sell. Yeah, that's sort of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Exactly. So, I mean, uh, the blending process is sort of, uh, you know, I'll pull, you know, 25 samples or so uh, when I do a blend. I'll pick my favorites based on the nose, mostly. i found that's my most valuable tool for picking. And then uh, I'll start making little uh, mock-up blends. And, uh, you know, if I, think it's, uh, if I think it's a little funny, I'll try and find the weak link. If it uh, needs something complex, a little more complexity, I'll add something funny and see what that does to it. But, uh, I mean, you know, we've got good, you know, the... the, the I'm, uh, we're definitely going to end up sitting on a lot of barrels doing it that way. I mean, some of our older stuff is going to be lingering around. Yeah. Not, so not saying that we're experts or anything, but we did do a show of uh, samples from you guys. Oh, yeah. And we tried to determine which one of the bottles was the final product. Oh. So it was, uh, it was pretty neat. Okay. Uh, I mean, we both, all of us, all three of us, all four of us guessed right. But it was okay. pretty obvious. I mean, they were still different. Okay. But it's like, it was kind of fun just to figure out, oh, wow, this is what these guys kind of do. Okay. So we were pretending. That's, so pretending uh, was fun. Well, <laughs> and, and what's, really, what's really neat, what, what they gave you a great example of, right, is so how every barrel is different. Yeah. Every barrel is unique. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So we run into that often when we're doing barrel tastings with mm -hmm. our customers. And, you know, like, dude, I, I love 341, but man, 345 tastes so much different. Like, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is definitely Rick House talk. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, every batch, in fact, every barrel is wildly different from the last. It's just well, they two filled on the same day that are worlds apart. I mean, it's my God, sitting right next to each other, they're vastly different. I mean, as consistent as we can make it back here, when nature takes the reins, that's you know where, so that's where the magic happens. Um, that's know. that's where he comes in next as our master. Uh, I'm not a master, not I'm just uh, that was a uh, that was the scary part starting out doing the blending because blending is definitely an art form, uh, and I'm not a blender, but uh, I don't know. I think I'm getting a handle on it. It's, uh, okay, so you're oh, becoming yeah. a wizard. Okay, I'm, I'm sure. little by little, each one keeps getting a little better than the last, uh, a little more well-rounded. Um, and, and the whiskey's getting there too. Like yeah, I said, that, that, that four-year mark I think is is going to be the sweet spot for, for a lot of people. Okay. So, and right, Max, you guys. Really, in a 25-gallon barrel, you, you can overage. Yes, you can. Yeah, that is a risk. Uh, I mean, yeah, the small barrels can get a little too oaky, a little too, a little too dark at a point. So, uh, again, that's where you come in. Yeah, right. Gets and, and, and on the sales part of things too, on my end, uh, I love the 25-gallon barrels as well as our customers because, of course, that gets them into a single barrel select program, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Typically now we're seeing a, a case yield of only 16 to 17 six packs, so uh, they love that. They can put their stamp on it. It's not breaking the bank, right? Most people are pretty comfy with doing 17 six packs. Um, you know that will all change so sooner rather than later because if I have my way with it this year, we will be getting short on 25 gallon barrels. Okay. Uh, so that's been one piece I've been letting all of our our accounts like Ben's Beverage Depot at Cedar Rapids, High V's and Cedar Rapids, you know, letting them know that we won't have these 25s forever where we can do this nice accommodating, you know, under 26 pack yield. So, right. Well, that's uh, a good problem to have, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, he's been killing it with selling those single barrels, him and Sean. Yeah. And, and whenever I sell a barrel, I make a point to come back and thank these guys because if it didn't taste out, they wouldn't be buying it. Right. Right. So, yeah. It, it just this makes my process. job a lot easier. No. So, um, haven't you guys won a bunch of really great awards here lately? Oh yeah, we have. So we're um, in a great tourist area, so we get a lot of people coming in from all over the United States 
um, but specifically we won Best of Madison for Destination Restaurant and that's really cool because we use our spirits in our distillery cuisine too so we're not just using it for mixology like we're getting creative and we're putting it into our food and our desserts. And your brownies are heaven. Oh thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Most yeah. sweets. All yeah. of the desserts are yeah. so oh, they good. Are. Yeah. Yeah. The cheesecake squirrel one. Is that they still got that up, right? Yeah. The cheesecake yeah. brownie. Yeah. We didn't have. That. Oh yeah, cheesecake brownie. Oh yeah, that was That's one. stupid. Good. <laughs> and, and, and the creme brulee. Oh, I love the creme brulee. Yeah. yeah. Burn had the creme brulee. And I I snuck a spoonful. Oh wow. Yeah. Really well, good. and uh, one of our travelers who came in, they were just raving about our flourless chocolate cake too. So. We couldn't have all on the first trip. So no. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's too cool for yeah. boating season for me. It all goes right to my hips. <laughs> but in addition to that, we were just at uh, American Craft Spirits, and uh, we won a bunch of awards there. I want to say all of our whiskeys actually got an award. Um, our brandy got a silver, and then we also did get get some awards in the vodka category as well. That's awesome. Is the London Spirits? Uh, London Spirits competition, they named us a top 10 U.S. Spirits brand that you must try. So that was a big one for us. And then we were recently in Whiskey Advocate too, and uh, we got an 89, an 88, and an 86. So those are all very good. And we know that as we get to that five-year mark, we're going to be getting those 90s. Yes. Don't Thanks. forget us when you guys go mainstream and you're all over the world. We'll never forget you guys. <laughs> we got How can we guys forget you guys? <laughs> yep. yeah. No, we'll always remember the, the 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 people and places that took care of us in the beginning. Yeah. Because you know. Yeah. So. Well, I also read that um, you guys got mentioned like in Forbes or. Okay, well, so we do yeah. have Inc. some Inc. exciting Inc. stuff. We were named an Inc. Uh, top five thousand company for two thousand eighteen. Um, we were tracking like 1,500 percent growth since we started uh, in 2014. Uh, we were in the top 500 at 316. And they invited uh, Renee out to be a speaker, so she was able to share, you know, passion and pivots and some of the pitfalls that you go through in starting a craft distillery, the investment, um, how you kind of have to shift and be a little nimble. Um, making different changes through through a, your growth and and we're really still at a brand awareness stage like we're getting a lot of great exposure um, which we're very thankful for uh, but we're this is a pivotal time for us like we really want to get the name out there we want, really want to grow within our Midwest states um, and branch out yeah, and I think that's really important what you guys are doing. Just you focus a lot more on your local area, you know, yeah. Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Take care of your backyard first, and then kind of start expanding. Well, you're in eleven states, right? Yeah, eleven. Yeah, eleven states. Yeah, 11 states. That's, pretty, that's great. I mean, for a four-year-old. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Kentucky, South Carolina, California, uh, with Connecticut, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Opening Michigan, Michigan now, so, Washington D.C., well, yeah. well, Costa Rica, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah we're working on a deal with Costa Rica, so there's, yeah. there's a few resorts out there that uh, uh, we're trying to work with. So uh, and they love our stuff, and, and they know Renee and Brian really well. So and awesome. Renee had she she did some sort of work with a cancer charity. The, the Love Your Melon. Oh, oh, yeah. So when we were out at Inc., uh, she co-presented with the Love Your Melon uh, business execs there. And uh, we're going to actually be doing a beanies and bourbon event in Minnesota, um, which is cool because we're distributed in Minnesota. So we're going to plan something with them. But we uh, branded beanies, and they were our Christmas gift this year. And 50% of that beanie donation does go back to the Cancer Society. We've got some yeah. cool stuff. Yeah, you got more ups and you got downs. So I think yeah. you guys are yeah. really just Definitely. doing it right. Yeah, and the fact that you guys are selling uh, whiskey in Wisconsin, uh, Kentucky, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. that still works. So. Yeah. yeah, it's like, hey! Kentucky. Yes, what? so we, we actually just sold, uh, we actually had a group from Kentucky, similar to yourselves, that came up and uh, 
picked two barrels uh, for their whiskey group out of Kentucky. And then uh, our my boss, Sean, who's our national sales manager, was just down in Kentucky on a trip and sold three barrels in his trip to liquor stores in the area. So actually four. He just got a phone call the other day that uh, a big liquor store outside of Louisville uh, will be bringing in another barrel. So. I think it's funny, like when we go to a lot of tastings, people will say, well, it can't be called bourbon because it's not from Kentucky. Like, what do you guys think about that? Uh, that's a common misconception. Yeah, bourbon by federal definition can be made anywhere within the United States borders. So, um, yeah, you'll have your purists that say it only can't come from Kentucky or only should anyway. Well, well, well we disagree. In the 60s. You know, I, I always like to say, you know, I mean, our stills come from Louisville, Kentucky, out of, like we said, Vendome Copper Brass Works, which is the Rolls Royce of stills. Mm -hmm. Our barrels all come from Kentucky. Our grain comes from Hodgson Mill, which is where, from what I've been told, a lot of the big boys get their, their grain from as well. So, in all honesty, minus our zip code, right. we're doing it just like they're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, With your own touch. Absolutely, yeah. and, and, we'll, and I'm sure Max and Nathan will touch on that when we go over to the Rick House as far mm -hmm. as you know what makes ours a little unique and obviously uh, I think a little bit of that the fact that our barrels are out in the elements in Wisconsin, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely a different climate than Kentucky. Yeah. Right. Should we, we go to the Rick House? Should we go freeze our buns off? Alright, come on, I'm going to grab a